Hey everybody, it's Mike and welcome to Chip Damage. And tonight we're talking about a franchise that is very near and dear to my heart. We are talking about the Halo series, yes. And why are we talking about it? Well, if somehow you didn't know, we are about one month out from the massive release of Halo Infinite. We are in that beautiful nebulous pre-release period where there's a lot of like hope, apprehension, and dare I say fear in the air. Because you know what? Despite the last couple of years being somewhat rocky for Halo, it's still a massive staple of the Xbox brand. It's a franchise that no matter what you play on, uh, even if you've been a fan for 20 years or if you've just been an outsider looking in, it is a franchise that is hard to ignore with all the hype it's had, with its legacy, and the sheer amount of marketing that it's been getting. So, what I want to talk about today is why I think Halo Infinite needs to succeed, why I want it to succeed, my personal history with the, with the series, with Halo, and why this series, I dare say, is my favorite first-person shooter franchise, uh, why it's special. Uh, I think a lot of people love Halo, but I haven't seen a lot of people articulate the same reasons that I love ha Halo, and I want to bring that to you, my audience, my viewers, and I want to see what you guys think about it. Are you, a f by the end of this video, I want you to comment and say, are you a fan of this franchise? Are you interested in it? Do you not like it? It's all fine. These are just opinions, um, and I want to get mine out there and say how I was introduced to it, why I think these games have consisted for the last 20 years, almost 21 years, and why I think Infinite is such a crucial release. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Yeah, let's start at the very beginning, shall we? Let's start with Halo Combat Evolved, of course. So yeah, I got this game back in launch in 2001. Um, you know, uh, back then I was begging my parents for an original Xbox. Uh, a number of my friends were because, you know, we just kept hearing about how powerful it was. We had seen demos of games like Project Gotham Racing just blowing everything else out of the water with, like, pure graphical fidelity. I was a kid, so that really, you know, that mattered a lot to me at the time. And, you know, like, oh, it had four-player, uh, it had four controller slots, and it had a DVD player, and there was, like, word that it was going to go online. Like, it sounded like a cool machine. Despite remembering, Microsoft being a huge company did not guarantee the Xbox's success. Uh, of course, companies like... Philips and Panasonic and even Atari had launched very powerful for their time consoles in the decade prior, but flopped tremendously. So just the name Microsoft being attached to the Xbox did not guarantee its success. Well, when it finally did release in uh, November 15, 2001 in the United States, the Xbox was a decent success. And that's where this story has to start. Um, Despite it being, of course, clobbered in sheer sales numbers by the PlayStation 2, I mean, everything gets clobbered in comparison to the PlayStation 2, the Xbox started a brand. It started the console line that's still going on to this day. And how did it do that? With a lineup of pretty damn good games right from out of the launch. And Halo, this game right here, was the spearhead of it. It wasn't the only great game on the console, as some people would have you say. There were a number of good titles right at the launch, like Dead or Alive 3, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2X, Project Gotham Racing, Munch's Odyssey. Games that would uh, very much be associated with Xbox as the years went on. But Halo was, like I said, the big one. The spearhead that had everyone shattering. And um, looking back at this game now, I mean, this this is actually my 20-year-old case. I mean, it's, it's pretty beat up and worn now, but... I have a lot of fond memories uh, of receiving this on Christmas and just playing through it all night. Um, looking back at Halo now, what was so special about this one game, this first-person shooter that, you know, as a kid, I hadn't heard, like, of anything of the developers. I didn't know who Bungie was. I never played Marathon on PC. I was a decent... Uh, I did play a decent number of PC shooters like Quake and Doom and Wolfenstein on PC, but Marathon had slipped me by, and, you know, I didn't play their other game, Oni, on PlayStation 2. I didn't know who Bungie was, um, this was just a game that I received and I played and by the time it was over, I couldn't stop playing. And I think a lot of Xbox owners uh, felt that way back in 2001. And on that note of 2001, let's talk about the year this released. What a hell of a year 2001 was. Remember, this was the year that Devil May Cry, Final Fantasy X, Silent Hill 2, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Luigi's Mansion, they all came out that year. Grand Theft Auto 3, how dare I forget. 2001 was absolutely insane and I think amongst all those games Halo did distinguish itself it's up there with all those titles as games that are beloved and continued on to this day like each one of those is a franchise uh, that is still going on to this day except for Silent Hill it's not coming back out uh, there's not never going to be that sequel stop building up hope for that but when I plugged this in, I mean, obviously the first thing you noticed were the visuals. They were pretty good. And even 20 years later on with the original graphics, they have a certain blocky charm. 
But when you look at its uh, contemporaries back in 2001, there wasn't too much else that looked that good. Of course, Final Fantasy X uh, and games of that caliber, sure, like they looked that good. But first-person shooters in general, the, the colors, the scope that Halo had, uh, right away it was pretty grabbing. And as I progressed... There was something about the gameplay. It was, as many people have noted, slightly slower than PC shooters at the time, but that kind of mm, compensated for the fact that you were on a controller. A controller kind of built for first-person shooters. Now, while games like uh, Turok and GoldenEye were kind of pioneers on console uh, first-person shooters, as many people have pointed out, Halo was kind of one of the settlers. It, it took what those games did and kind of solidified, condensed, uh, coagulated it into something that would go forward for years and years. Um, so the controls were, were fantastic, and it, it had a balance. Of course, everyone knows in Halo you can only carry two weapons at a time, and that seemed restrictive to me as a kid at the time, but I'm like, oh, there's there's a balance. Like, whoever thought of that, they're like, well, they're not just going to carry an arsenal on their back the whole time. They have to make tough choices about what they're going to pick and when they're going to, uh, what enemies they're going to fight with these weapons. And there were so many... When I look back, fantastic ideas that this game had all the way back then that carry on to this day. It truly is a special title. If you've never played Halo Combat Evolve, and uh, this is a tangent, but if you were a PlayStation 2 GameCube kid, uh, if you were never on the Halo train or Xbox train, keep in mind, I'm a person who is lucky enough to have all three consoles and be a PC gamer. So I'd like to think I have a somewhat objective point of view. It's nearly impossible to have an objective point of view on video games. I mean, we all are introduced... But I'm someone who is never a console fan, but I think a good game is a good game no matter what you play it on. Um, Halo is a great game. Um, get any uh, ideas that you may have about a bad fan base, like kids screaming, you're online, out of your head. Um, if you're even a little bit curious, and give it a shot just on its own merit, and you'll see what I'm talking about. This game started the Bungie era of games of Halo. Like They had a sense of... Dare I say cosmic whimsy? Yeah, I know that sounds strange, especially for a first-person shooter that has leaned more into the militaristic side of things, but there was some legitimate whimsy and, dare I say, heart in this game. Um, and let me explain that. Um, everything in Halo, the environments, let's say, there is such an, a sense of awe in them. You're in these alien environments that at the time were huge for a first-person shooter, not anything uh, in, by today's standards, but they were big and beautiful and weird. Um, and you were, you had a sense of being alone. Um, I always said this Halo one's campaign was so good because you had a sense of impending doom, danger, uh, isolation. You didn't know what was going on. You crash landed on this giant alien ring, uh, called Halo surrounded by your enemies. And we're going to talk about those enemies in a minute. And there was just this sense of Awe, like I said, awe. Like you would look off in the distance, seeing these tremendous alien structures. You didn't know their purpose, but you would see them scattered amongst the nature, and you would just stop and look, or at least I did. I just loved looking at the environment of Halo, clear the area of enemies, and there was not many collectibles or any at the time to really go and explore for. There was no real reason to go do it, other than the joy of seeing these environments and trying to piece together this this lore. Because on the note of lore, Halo for a first-person shooter for any game has quite a bit of lore. And in the first game, there's not a lot of exposition. The character that you play as and what's going on, the war, that's mostly explained in the manual. And in most cases, that would be a bad thing. Like you need to read outside uh, material to know what's going on. But keep in mind, back in the day, and my OG gamers out there know this, reading the manual was always a joy uh, in games. I miss gaming manuals. But despite that lack of knowledge, if you were to just start playing Halo 1 even without reading the manual... It gets you up to speed on what you need to do, who you are, and where you're going very quickly. It, get, it got you invested in the story. And let's talk about that story. Well, the first thing about a story is the character. Who are you in this game? You are the Master Chief, uh, as he'd be later known, John 117, Spartan 117. Um, this fellow right here. And, you know, I've seen a lot of criticism, uh, even back then, but up until this day, about this character. Like, oh, he's a blank slate, he's boring, blah, blah, blah. Well, I have a somewhat different take. Um, many people say that he is a uh, b bland, like he is just an avatar for the player to fill. Like, you know, that's why you never see the character's face. Um, I think that is an appearance only because this character does have a personality. He is not, he's actually the polar opposite of someone like Gordon Freeman on Half-Life 2 or Link. And lovely game. I love Zelda. I love Half-Life, but he's different than those. Those are silent protagonists, especially in the case of uh, any Link that isn't the Wind Waker Link, who definitely has a personality, but since they don't speak, 
uh, you can fill them easily, um, despite knowing what they look like, even if they look nothing like you. But the Master Chief is, of course, voiced by the wonderful Steve Downs for the 20 years. And the voice work in this game is wonderful from that character in particular, from Master Chief, because his voice conveys confidence without arrogance. A sly wit without being too jokey as so many shooters are uh, these days. Like everything's got to be a one line or a joke. And that there's one or two of those in Halo, but it never goes over the top. The Master Chief, um, as games went on, you'd explore more in his character, but you actually got a sense of who you're playing as in this. Someone who's level-headed, maybe ignorant of the situation, but knows how to handle it. This is a larger-than-life situation, and he is just larger-than-life enough to deal with it, but not so over-the-top that there's no danger. And I've always loved that about his character. And of course, you are accompanied by his Navi, uh, if for my Ocarina fans out there, his Cortana, who has uh, definitely gone on to go to some strange directions in uh, later years but originally she was like your navigator get uh, your earpiece telling you what you needed to do what you needed to look out for and maybe giving you some advice and she was fantastic i believe the voice actor voice actress for that is uh, jen taylor the you know the the cortana and all the microsoft systems now and she was just great even though you had her with you all the time you never you know she was an ai you knew you were still really alone in this situation and you had to face quite the army and let's talk about that army shall we and as I go on, I want to mention that what I'm saying now applies to all the future Halo titles, unless I specify otherwise. The Chief's character and the enemies, their AI, uh, when things change, I'll bring that up. But this is kind of going forward for the Bungie games, at least. Let's talk about the enemies now. The Covenant. What a staple of enemies. These enemies in themselves have become icons on their own. The Grunts, the Jackals, the Elites, the Hunters. Um, initially, what seems like a small enemy variety. And enemy, enemy variety is huge for me in games. I hate fighting the same three guys with guns or swords over and over again. And Halo kind of dances around this in a very interesting way. Number one, in 2001, this AI was staggering for the enemies. They, uh, they, they would strategize. They would get behind cover. They would jump out of the way. They knew what to do depending on what distance you were. They would take cover. Um, you know, they would have formations, elites in the back, little guys in front. Uh, you know, hunters were used more like artillery. And each one of those enemies had color-coded armors that would dictate their rank and their uh, characteristics, their strategy. And that that's insane to me when you think about it. Like, there's like five versions of elites. And they had to account for the AI, the shield strength, the health for each one of those colors. And it also depends on what weapon they're holding. So in a, a gold elite holding, let's say, a sword is very different than a red elite holding a plasma pistol. Like, those are two very different enemies that react in very different ways. And their foot soldiers around them will act accordingly. So, yeah, there was enemy variety. And then you bring in vehicles that you have to fight uh, and commandeer, which is something that many first-person shooters still don't get right today. Vehicles were wonderful in Halo, from the legendary Warthog to the very fun Ghost and Banshee. Um, they were both enemy types and ways of transportation, adding to the variety. And as you go on, of course, the very contentious Flood. Well, let me keep uh, let me put this in perspective for you. The first time people encountered the Flood in 2001, it was amazing. It was scary. I was scared. Um, you encounter a new enemy halfway through this game. You're getting comfortable in this quite long campaign fighting against certain types of enemies. And then they throw you a curveball. They throw you a third faction to fight. And it was terrifying. You didn't know what was going on. They're just mindless zo uh, zombies who just kind of run at you. They, and you have to compensate for that, fighting close, fighting far. And then the Covenant and you and the Flood have a three-way battle. And you can let them fight it out and kind of sneak your way through. There's a pretty impressive kind of enemy dynamic not seen in many games, especially first-person shooters at that time. I'm sure there are some that I'm overlooking, but Halo is definitely kind of at the forefront of that. Even now, if you go back, even shooters today don't necessarily have AI that good, um, you know, where there's multiple factions and enemy types kind of weaving together so well, kind of thatching together into like a wonderful combat blanket, as it were. You know, and of course, to fight these enemies, you're giving a number of weapons, not a huge number and none that are overpowered, but each that are just specifically right for a situation. And being that you only have to carry, you can only carry two weapons. You had to decide what was best for the situation ahead. I see this group of enemies in front of me. I think this group of enemies is going to be in front of me. What should I take? Something long range and close range, something good against energy shields, something not wonderful, wonderful on your feet. Thinking is what it encouraged. Though it seemed limiting, it made you a better player. And you had AI companions on the occasion that uh, would help you out. And some were dumb as hell, but, you know, they were decent on the gun if you're driving the Warthog and they're in the back and on the side. You need to have your Marines. But yet again, 2001, fairly impressive. Um, I, I don't think Halo gets enough 
uh, kind of praise for that campaign, the structure, they'll say, oh, the campaign is good because it's long or you go to a lot of vistas, and that's very true. However, the actual mechanics of that campaign were what really drew me to this game. I went through the campaign on all four difficulty levels because let me tell you, Halo to this day does difficulty levels right. Easy, normal, heroic, legendary, and there'd be modifiers later on, changing the enemy variety, the placement, your ammo capacity, your damage. It's so much, it's like a different game every time you go through it, and that hooked me on Halo for months. Um, I was one of the first one in my group of friends to have Halo, so we would come by and do co-op campaign, which not every Halo would have in the future, and not every first-person shooter has now. And that was so much fun. There's no story reason why there should be two Spartans. As far as you know, uh, Master Chief is the only Spartan, but they threw it in there because it was fun to do co-op. Um, later, as time went on, my friends got Halo. Uh, they saw mine. They're like, I'm going to get an Xbox and play this. We eventually ended up playing multiplayer against each other in the legendary split-screen Halo multiplayer. Um, and then they had the Xbox had a wonderful feature where via Ethernet cable, you can connect systems through System Link. If you had two TVs, two Xboxes, and two copies of the game, it was a lot of work to lug around two TVs and do it. But man, we did it. We'd hook up one in, uh, between two, two TVs, between two rooms, put a curtain between them and do 4v4. Halo's multiplayer basically speaks for itself. And I think that attracted the, more, the larger audience. Many people are like myself are a fan of the campaign and multiplayer. But the multiplayer is what really stuck out for, I believe, for Halo and made it the cash cow that it was. But like I said, what what besides the mechanics of this game, what gave it heart? Well, like I said, these characters did stick out. Master Chief, Cortana, even minor characters like uh, Captain Keys and Sergeant Avery Johnson. Um, it was, There's something about the way Bungie made these games that let you know that they loved making these games. Um, little tricks you could do, grenade jumping, little glitches that you know were left in, or maybe not, but even if they you know, were found later, Bungie kind of openly embraced that for their community to experiment with their physics engine. They call it the sandbox, right? You can kind of play around and see what you want to do. These were, these were game developers kind of on the edge trying to find, hey, just what's fun? There was a side that was very famously working on more in the story, one more in the gameplay, and they just met somewhere in the middle. And there's no ego to Halo when you play it. There's so many shooters nowadays and even in the later halo games where there's just like this oorah like let's go get them let's blow shit up like you know this heartless um action and that's fine there's, there's nothing wrong with mindless uh, mindlessness in video games that could be a lot of fun but in first person shooters there's uh, kind of two extremes and there's many things in the middle but there's like the extreme militaristic kind of you know like i said mountain dew and dorito infused um, no story really, like there is a campaign, but it's very much a staple non afterthought Call of Duty type of shooters. And then there's the very story heavy shooters uh, that are very sci-fi, very focused on their single player, like Singularity or Bioshock or Conduit, all great games on both sides. Halo kind of carved out its own niche somewhere in the middle where it takes from both, but it's not a copy of either. And it has a very distinct flavor. Of course it has a military backdrop, but it's also in a massive space opera, as it were, like a Dune-esque space opera. It's like an adult sci-fi that you can also go goof off in. Um, I, I feel like that that's a lost art. That's a very rare thing. And that's where it kind of um, differentiates itself. It has a soul. It has class to it, dare I say. Now, when uh, Halo 1 came out, it was a massive hit, and I loved it. And like I said, for two or three years, me and my buddies would go through that campaign multiple times trying to do tricks. And then uh, do split screen, and then three years later, we are graced with this beauty right here, here, Halo 2. And uh, yeah, this is the limited edition I'm holding in my hands. This one has a special place in my heart because this is the game I attended my first midnight launch forever at GameStop. Yeah, this this game I waited online for. I think it was the third or fourth person there. I got like there like seven hours early. And I'm like, there's one guy in front of me, and there's like one other friend. We, we didn't need to do this. This was nuts. Um, Within two hours, there were 100 people out there. Within three hours, there were 400 people. It was insane how many people turned out to buy this game. And, you know, considering that the Xbox ended up selling somewhere between 24 and 25 million units, which by today's standards is not a ton, uh, very small comparison to its direct competitor, the PS2. Um, if a console launched with that many, much today, it would be considered a huge failure. Um, the, the the amount of people drawn to Halo uh, was insane. Like even though it was a smaller audience, it was a very enthusiastic audience, and obviously would spawn many things. But we waited three years for Halo Two, and when it came out, 
man, maybe some people disagree with me, but it mostly lived up to them. I think it surpassed expectations. Um, as far as campaign, very different than Halo 1. Uh, it gave you the side of the Covenant story as well. They were translated into English. So you played as both the Master Chief and an elite called the Arbiter on the Covenant side. And uh, they were they were dubbed in English. You got a good idea of what you were fighting. The Covenant were very, uh, very alien, as it were, in Halo 1. Not speaking English, you didn't know much about them. But you really got an inside look at their society in Halo 2. And it was very interesting. It was beautiful. It let you explore more vistas on Covenant worlds uh, as the Arbiter explored. As Master Chief also was doing his own thing. So it gave you two sides to a very fun story that, of course, uh, ended in the greatest cliffhanger in gaming history. The finish the fight uh, finale, which... Hell, I was pissed too, but I was I knew there was gonna be a Halo 3 now. Like when that happened, I'm like, oh can't wait till they make three now. And of course, we have to talk about multiplayer if we're talking Halo 2. Halo 2 is the game that made Xbox Live the sensation that it continues to be to this very day. Uh, remember in the sixth generation of consoles, yes, the GameCube and PS2 had some online functionality. I myself loved playing Metal Gear Solid 3 subsistence online on the PS2. There were uh, some GameCube games like Animal Crossing City Folk and Odama and uh, Fantasy Star that had some online functionality. And of course, PS2 also had like SOCOM and things, but those services were not as solid or widespread as it was uh, for the Xbox and Halo 2. Uh, Almost everyone who had an Xbox had to have Halo 2 and um, and an Xbox Live subscription. I believe this game ended up selling eight or nine million copies, which is like over a third of the amount of Xboxes out there. If a game came out today on the PlayStation 4 and a third of the PlayStation 4's user base bought it, it'd be like the biggest game ever. Like that, it, it would be like that. That's unheard of. Even massive titles like God of War or Spider-Man that sell. 20 million copies. That's only a fifth or a sixth of the PlayStation's uh, install base. So everyone who had an Xbox, for the most part, like I said, a third, uh, a good chunk, got Xbox Live to play this online. And man, that multiplayer was something else. Um, not entirely different than Halo 1's, but like the map design, they, they kind of refined it. And it was, is it better than Halo 1? No, it's just very different. There's new weapons. Uh, there, there was new ability, like you had a higher jump. There's a different weight to everything. The battle rifle, the BR, one of the most famous Halo weapons was introduced in this. And it really carried the torch well. And it was actually a pretty good pseudo swan song for the Xbox. It would, This released in November 2004, and the Xbox 360 would come out a year later in 2005. There was like a solid year where, despite it not being anywhere near the best-selling console, everyone was talking about Halo 2. Uh, despite some graphical glitches, the game was definitely rushed. It looked pretty good in action. Like the cutscenes were kind of rough. Um, and they introduced some great characters, uh, like Admiral Hood, voiced by Ron Perlman. There, there was a lot of celebrities who played this game and advertised this game. Uh, th there was you just couldn't escape it. And looking back, like that's so nuts to me that a console that only sold that much. I mean, relatively at the time, it was a little. You know, it wasn't bad. Had so much coverage. This game scored through the roof, and it made console online play kind of a thing to compete with PC. Of course, PC will always be the king, will always be the first when it comes to online first-person shooter play in a lot of ways, but Xbox had now entered the conversation well ahead of its competitors, and I think, I think that's what carried the Xbox 360 so strongly in the beginning of its life cycle. Me, myself, I love this game yet again. Um, playing it uh, system link, playing online, my first online shooter or console game was this. I had played some PC uh, shooters like, like I said, Doom, Quake, Alien vs. Predator Online, but never to the extent of Halo. It was so easy. I mean, I had to run a 20 foot ethernet cable from my uh, bedroom to my living room uh, through the hallway. Thank you, mom and dad, for letting me do that as a kid, but it was a very easy service. And unfortunately, I have to sh shift gears here a little bit because I want to talk about Halo in a broader scope. There's this uh, idea that when you go online and you play Halo, you're just gonna hear terrible slurs, screaming children, mean people, as it were, on Xbox Live when you're playing Halo. And unfortunately, that is not just true for Halo, that is true for any online multiplayer video game. Uh, there's always gonna be a large toxic fan base who, you know, they're great people on their own probably, but something just switches in their brains when they're online and they're anonymous. And, you know, that's that's unfortunately a stigma that was attached to Halo as years went on. Like, oh, you're just going to hear some terrible slurs going on and you're going to get cursed out. It's going to ruin the game for you. But honestly, that's any game uh, when you go online. 
And it's something that if you fight through or, you know, hopefully you don't encounter too much, won't deter you from playing what's a legendary game. Um, I think that's where a lot of outsiders look at Halo uh, as something as a throwaway franchise. Oh, it's just some game that like screaming children play online. No, it's not that. It may have attracted some of that audience with Halo 2 with online functionality um, because you're talking to those gamers. But the people that were there at the beginning and the people who are really there because they love the world, they love the gameplay, they recognize that this is not just a game that's run, bang, shoot, go kill everything. That's who you want to talk to. Those are the real Halo fans. Um, this is not like a mindless, like, you kill bad guys, go shoot things games, um, you know, while people teabag you and call you noob online. That exists, unfortunately. But if you can look past that, you are going to find a fantastic game with Halo 2. And it was supported for quite a bit because in its lifetime, um, you got this, the Halo 2 multiplayer map pack, like on disc DLC back in 2005. Yeah, uh, this added like nine maps. Uh, you could download this online, but I, of course, wanted a physical one just for posterity's sake. Adding to this game, it gave it quite the number of maps. This was big. Like people were really looking forward. It's like, oh, more maps because, you know, you're playing hundreds of matches on Halo 2. And uh, there was just a good extension. Then Halo 2, like I said, ended on a massive cliffhanger. I love the game, but it was time for the seventh gen. But in the meantime, actually, in between Halo 1 and 2, this franchise was really expanding. Not just into video games, but into books. And I don't talk about a lot of books on this channel. I don't intend to, really. But, um, you know, because most video game adaptations, a lot of them, not all of them, there's some good ones out there, are schlock, right? They're thrown out there to make a quick buck. Maybe the author isn't quite invested in the source material. I've read some not bad ones. I've read the Mass Effect ones are actually really good though, but this one, Halo, The Fall of Reach by Eric Nyland. This little book right here, which I've had to rebuy multiple times because I keep losing it. This changed the Halo franchise, believe it or not. I bought this in between the wait between Halo 1 and 2, and it made me a lifelong Halo fan. I read through, this is one of the only books I've read through three times. Um, and I fully suggest that you give it a shot, even if you're not a Halo fan, but you're just a good sci-fi fan. This took the groundwork that was in Halo, and I believe it had uh, kind of overseeing kind of counseling from Bungie employees and expanded the Halo lore so much in such a wonderful way. You learned who you were, the Master Chief. You learned why humans were fighting the Covenant. You learned what the world was like. You learned what the UNSC was. You learned about the Master Chief's childhood, Cortana's genesis, uh, Dr. Halsey. It introduced a bunch of characters that would later be introduced and made important in the games. And that's both the strength and weakness to Halo later in the games, uh, over incorporation of outside lore into the game story, where you might be excluded or feel isolated if you didn't read books or, or, or like read a wiki on it. But at the time, the games were very good at balancing this. Um, but this game, post Halo 2, was referenced so much in little ways that if you were a fan and you had read it, you're going to get more out of it. And I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. Like You can have outside material. Um, like I think a bad example is Final Fantasy XV's Kingslave, where you really need to watch that movie to know what the hell is going on in the beginning of XV. If you didn't and you still enjoyed XV, that's fine. But I tell you now, you will have a far greater understanding of what's going on in that game if you play Kingslave, where this just enhances that base material. It makes you want to get back into that base material and enjoy more. Maybe look at it a little differently. You're a little bit more informed. Maybe, uh, you know, the exposition isn't as important to you as it would be someone playing through, but I think the games do a wonderful, at least the earlier games do a wonderful job of letting you know what's going on. But this, this book is written almost like in a journal way. Um, it, it's a war story. It's a hard sci-fi story. It's an adult story, and it's just very fascinating. And this book has been reprinted many, many times, and they've had to make small addendums and reprints of it to kind of match the lore better with the games. And it was a blessing and a curse. It got a lot of fans into it, but it may have isolated some. But if you are, like I said, uh, an avid reader or you like Halo, there are tons of Halo books. Uh, I can't, I've, only, I've read a few of them. Some are good, some are not good. This one is great. Please check out The Fall of Reach. This has been adapted into comic books. This has been adapted into a web series, animation, many different medias, like all uh, parts of Fall of Reach. However, I believe to this day the best media to, to experience this story is right here. Uh, this is not, the, by the way, the game uh, Halo Reach that, that is very reaches a planet in the Halo universe. Fall of Reach is not the novelization of Reach. This is a prequel uh, to the whole Halo franchise. And I think it, that story is best told in novel form right here, the Halo Fall of Reach novel by Eric Nyland. Check this out. This was, a, this was a gap filler while I was waiting for games. Speaking of waiting for games, um, <laughs> when I finally got 
the, the game that I've been waiting three years for. What a ride. I can't wait to talk about this title. We are, of course, talking about Halo 3 on the Xbox 360. The game that helped the 360 dominate the early 7th generation. Um, you know, I, I just started working at a video game store in 2007. This was the first big release that I worked. Uh, and I'll tell you, man, there were so many people hyped for this. People were buying 360s left and right for this game. Remember, this was not a launch title. Xbox came out in North America in late November 2005. This came out in, I believe, September 2007. People had to wait two years, but they knew it was coming. Um, this game was advertised like crazy. The, the, the sheer scale of this game, it's hard to even compare to games today. And given there are more gamers today than ever before, but this game just felt like it was everywhere. Times Square had billboards. Uh, there were crazy marketing campaigns. Uh, the ads online, on television, Super Bowl commercials. And the, you know what? Yet again, Bungie, the people who made this really showed an appreciation for this material. There was, there are some ads out there and there are people today who make YouTube videos about going back and reacting to those ads, to those commercials, to those uh, trailers for Halo 3, the, the Believe ad. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, but if you don't, please YouTube Halo Believe ad. And people have made videos about it. It's probably my favorite piece of marketing ever for a video game, a movie, anything. Yeah, it's that powerful. Um, it, the, the, the creators, I don't know if they had a bungee. They definitely must have had some oversight on the vibe of their media. Yet again, it didn't have this bang, bang, shoot, go kill bad guys feeling. It had heart. It had soul. It was respecting its players and its content by making it feel adult. Yes, you were a super soldier fighting blue aliens, but the fact of the matter is they treated it with respect and you could feel that. I'm always a fan. I believe in most media, whether it be film, anime, video games, what have you, I think that great creators can communicate to their audiences in a very subtle and tangible way. You can feel a creator's intent when you're enough into uh, a certain media. You can feel what they're trying to say to you and that's love. when they can, when they connect with you and you like what they're selling, you buy what they're selling, that's wonderful. And what Bungie was selling was a super fun uh, game that didn't take itself too seriously but respected itself and that showed far even showed in even the media. Look at the Starry Night trailer for Halo 3 that was aired during the Super Bowl. That probably sold 100,000 Xbox 360s that very day. So this game finally launched on, I believe, I believe it was mid-November or mid-September 2007. And of course, I got it right after I was done selling copies of it. I got the Legendary Edition. I have that helmet somewhere in storage. $130. I'll never forget that just seems so outlandish for a collector's edition. But now that's like on the low end. But $130 back in 2007 for a game? <laughs> Sound insane. But I needed to have it. Because this was Halo 3, baby. This this was a new Halo. The, the last in the trilogy on a new piece of hardware. I think my hype for this game is only matched by Metal Gear Solid 4 on PS3 and the Final Fantasy 7 Remake. The, those are probably the most, the games that I wanted the most ever in my life, the most anticipated for. And Halo 3, maybe to some it wasn't the, what they wanted, but to me it certainly was. The campaign, while shorter uh, than Halo 1 and 2's, was such a wild ride. Four-person co-op, and you know, you goddamn know, I played that with three of my best friends late into that night. Then when we beat it, we weren't even like, oh, it's over. Like, no, let's go through it again on Heroic and then Legendary and then... Always play the campaign first, and then we jumped into multiplayer. And, you know, for consoles, the seventh generation was really where online took off. Of course, you had it's uh, the Genesis and earlier consoles, and the Xbox was probably the biggest pioneer. But 360, PS3, like the, particularly the 360, was really where the online kind of marketplace, the, the zeitgeist, that, if you will, kind of began, of online play kind of being the focus of big shooters. And Halo nailed that. Let me tell you, still has my favorite multiplayer to this day. To this day. Um, I love Halo 2, but Halo 3 kind of took some things back from Halo 1, Halo 2 mixed them together into this beautiful chimera of a game that just grew and grew over time with more DLC and patches. I remember the Ryu Hayabusa armor tied in my other Xbox, favorite Xbox 360 game, uh, Ninja Gaiden 2. Um, there was customizable armors and, you know, it, the online actually worked a lot better than the original Xboxes, which was okay for, remember, 2004, just to get like eight... 8 to 16 people in a game and not just immediately explode. Pretty impressive, but the 360 really pushed that. And uh, yeah, this, this carried the 360 through its early years. I, it, it's reviewed through the roof. I believe until Super Smash Brothers 
Ultimate, and I could be wrong on here, I have to double check the numbers, Halo 3 was the highest selling console exclusive up until that point, uh, ever since Halo 3. Might have been Reach, but I believe it was Halo 3. That's, that's insane to me. Like that game held that record for so, so, so long. Um, because if you had a 360, you kind of had to get this game. You didn't play one or two, that multiplayer was just, you know, if you weren't in the story, the multiplayer was just too good to avoid. And uh, this game went on for quite a while, and um, it was very special. I mean, this people, most Halo fans say, go back to this. And there's a good reason why. Everyone has their favorites between 1, 2, and 3, but most people say, like, yeah, can you bring it back to Halo 3? There's crazy stuff. There was uh, more enemy types. There was more vehicles. There was... Uh, equipment abilities uh, something separate from your melee uh your grenades or your your standard weapons like a, a piece of equipment that you could actually throw to enhance the battle adding another layer of depth but uh you know good things must come to an end but halo 3 went on for quite a while but about two years later what was started as expansion became its own brand new game and what i have here is halo 3 odst the uh, collector's edition as it were now the collector's edition of this game just came with that green xbox 360 controller which i love by the way i love that controller but i needed to have this It was like 90 dollars. not a bad deal for like a controller and the game um what is halo 3 odst well this is this is a game that i think has been redeemed by history now what halo 3 odst originally was going to be was Again, uh, an expansion pack to Halo 3 called Halo Recon, where you played as ODST, Orbital Drop Shock Troopers, um, humans. Uh, Master Chief is a seven-foot super soldier. These were regular Marines, uh, badass Marines, but it was going to give you more of a down-to-earth feel, a stealth feel. And most people maligned how short the game was. You could really almost beat it in a single sitting, five, six, seven hours. However, within those five, six, seven hours, it almost gave you an open city to explore, which is something somewhat new for Halo. Uh, it also introduced the firefight mode for both single and multiplayer, where it was one of the earliest horde modes, um, and a fantastic one at that. The game's real strength, though, having recently replayed it, despite its length, is its style. Halo 3 ODST, right here, has one of my favorite vibes, and not just a Halo game, but like any game. It has a somber, sad style. You're on Earth uh, in Halo 3 ODST, post an invasion by the Covenant in a ruined city in Africa called New Mombasa. And you just see the wreckage of the city and there's sad, jazzy music. There's a smoky feel to the whole thing. It's truly a atmospheric game. And I cannot, uh, I cannot emphasize enough that if you haven't played this, if you've heard negative things perhaps about it because of its length, please give it a shot. It's widely available on the Xbox One and PC now. It is worth your time. Um, the characters really grow on you in this. Um, they had Nathan Fillion show up, which was odd, as a and uh, multiple other celebrity kind of voice cameos. But despite all that, like this is a truly unique kind of darker take a uh, uh, look at the Halo franchise. And um, for the time being, this was you know uh, the last first-person shooter Xbox th uh, last Halo first-person shooter style on the Xbox 360. There was a bit of a break. Uh, after that because the Halo trilogy had wrapped up it was a very kind of tight story from one to three where the chief ended that trilogy with a wake me when you need me line we wouldn't need him for uh, just yet but man do we need him now but during that break there was some new there were some things in the middle that were some were fantastic uh, and we're going to talk about those now as we continue on um, we had the release of Halo Wars yes now this what is this Halo Wars is not a first person shooter Halo Wars is a uh, RTS, much like StarCraft. Um, and it was an attempt to make a console RTS, which really hadn't been done too much before. Of course, it was like StarCraft 64. And uh, it's somewhat maligned for how sim simple the game is, but you know what, it works and it's fun. And if you're not like brand new, if you're brand new to RTSs, this is a great one to start with. And even if you're not, I feel like people get a little, um, like, <sighs> A little arrogant, a little snooty with it, like, oh, you know, console RTS. Like, no, it works. Yeah, it's simple, but that doesn't mean it's not fun. I actually really enjoy this game. I have not yet played Halo Wars 2. Uh, I got to jump into that before Infinite comes out, or even afterwards. I'm going to play it. But uh, I enjoyed this game. Like I said, I was, I'm was i a big StarCraft player, and I, I understood that there was some complaints with the game's simplicity. Like, I had them, but I'm like, the Halo War world is so cool. It kind of carried the game. Uh, you not play as Master Chief. This takes place 25 years before Halo 1. Uh, different Spartan team, different characters. It was just cool to be able to control Marines and Covenant um, in a different way. Explain the lore. Uh, this game is also on the Xbox One and PC, I believe, at this point. 
So check it out if you've avoided it just because you said it's not complicated enough. Like, eh, so what? It's still a cool game, Halo Wars. Check it out, despite what some people have said. But um, like I said, in this era, post-2007 to a, uh, between 2010, we had releases like Halo Wars and Halo 3 ODST. We had multiple books. But Halo was still growing. It was getting bigger as a franchise. And in 2010, we would get something, a piece of media that is often overlooked. We would get this right here, Halo Legends. I have a very soft spot for uh, this anime right here. And that's, that's right, that's what I said. This is a Halo anime. Um, what this is, if you're familiar with the Animatrix or Batman Gotham Knight, you'll immediately know. This is an anthology series of, I believe, eight different Halo stories taking place at different times and places throughout the universe, expanding the lore of the Halo universe. Um, all done in anime style by different anime studios. Each one of those vignettes, each one of those shorts are done by a different anime company, kind of giving their own flair, flavor, and take on the Halo universe. Um, this is wonderful. Not everything in here is canon, I can tell you that right now. However, the stories are told in such a wonderful, some are wacky, uh, some are sad, some are very unique. And I, I strongly suggest if you're a Halo fan or an anime fan, check this out. You get to see fantastic studios like Madhouse and Genion put their best stuff to work here. And uh, it's often forgotten about. Like, There's not too many re-releases of this. I'm not sure if this got a blue area release. Correct me if you know. Um, but I'll tell you right now, there's one particular story in here. And for those who have seen this, you'll know my favorite is Prototype, my boy Ghost. I rewatch that all the time. It's like a 10 minute short. It's one of my favorite pieces of Halo media. It's one of my favorite anime shorts of all time. I dare say it. But you had uh, companies like Toei put their two cents in on Halo. There were some CG ones. Um, some are odd, some are very straight laced, some are very militaristic, some are very ph philosophical. One is watercolored and is told from the perspective of elites right before the Covenant War began. Uh, this is a wild and wacky thing that I think uh, was very popular to do back then. Like I said, Animatrix, Gotham Knight, Dante's Inferno, um, the, the, the animated spinoffs, not all are great. Like You got like the Dead Space ones, but Halo put some work into it. Like I said, Bungie was still at the helmet this time. And they made sure that all their spinoff media was some. They were consulted. They oversaw it a little bit. Uh, don't don't let this one skip you by if you're a fan or an anime fan. It's Halo Legends. Uh, there's multiple ways to see this. You can see it pretty much all online. But uh, if you could support it, find the DVD. Um, you know, if there's a blue recent Blu-ray release, please check that out. But this is almost forgotten by history. It's 10, 11 years old now, which is nuts to me, but definitely worth checking out. And um, yeah, so for three years between 2007, 2010. We didn't get a uh, brand new full-fledged uh, first-person shooter, Halo, but that all changed in 2010 with the mysterious announcement of this game right here, Halo Reach, uh, who you have been seeing the collector's edition statue of at my side this whole time. Um, this is another game that I think has been somewhat redeemed uh, as time has gone by. I love this game, but what is this? This is another prequel to Halo made by Bungie yet again in their last uh, effort uh, uh, with the Halo franchise. It takes place moments before Halo 1, leading up to the last moments before Halo 1, first moments of Halo 1, as I should say. Uh, you play as a group of Spartan 3s, which is a different class of Spartans than uh, John 117, except for my boy George. Uh, he is a Spartan 2. You can tell by his bulk. He's this guy right here. And it, uh, it's a much darker, more militaristic take, dare I say, on Halo. You kind of lose some of that space opera -y feel. You have a more uh, down-to-earth kind of uh, scattered feel. It is right during the Covenant attack of the titular Reach, uh, which is a planet the Spartans trained on. So right as an investigation into Covenant goings-on on Reach is going down, they launch a full-scale attack. There's never really a chance to regroup. Uh, the Spartans keep their cool, but they're scattered leadership. They're just trying to fight back the Covenant the best they can. And it's a hell of a story. These characters are only with you for a short time, but they grow on you. Uh, Reach brought in some very cool effects like jetpacks, um, some new weaponry. There was a controversial addition of the uh, bloom effect where uh, the more the weapon fires, the, the, the wider the spread gets. So like accurate aiming becomes more difficult, which is very controversial in the competitive scene. But... Halo Reach is still a wonderful game. It incorporated the firefight from ODST and expanded upon it. And something I failed to mention with Halo 3 uh, that Reach expanded on that is something you do not see in many shooters these days are is Forge. Now, many games have custom modes, first-person shooters, where you can decide how many lives, how many kills, maybe some weapon placements. But Halo 3 and Halo Reach, the Forge mode is literally letting you become a game developer. You decide what goes where precisely, where the weapons go, where the 
vehicles go, where you spawn, uh, where the effects, like where boxes are stacked. If you want an empty arena, you can. You can flatten the whole thing out and build up from there. If you want a stack of scorpion tanks on one side, you can. If you want to like just edit a stage that's just flying battles, you can. All one weapon. The amount of customization is something I still, I, I'm not sure, but I don't think exists in any other first person shooter to this day. The Forge in Halo 3 and Halo Reach was continuously improved on throughout its lifetime. And by the time both those games ended, uh, it was the customization options were insane. You were practically programming the game. Even in the horde mode, the firefight mode, you can decide what enemies were coming. If you just wanted an army of grunts coming at you all day with modifiers that made their heads explode in a confetti, you could. And that was so much fun once you took the time to decide. It was a fantastic level editor. Um, so you, in these games, in Halo 3 and in Reach, you had a great campaign, you had a great multiplayer, you had a great map editor and customization, you had a great firefight. These games were total packages. And they still, like I said, if you were just playing them for any one of those motions, you could, uh, any one of those modes, you could tell these games had heart. Even in the multiplayer, the detail on the stages, um, the 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 way that everything kind of flowed. They made sure that these stages were, these multiplayer stages, where you were just going to run around and be more focused on killing your opponent. They were still beautiful and very, um, the, the, there was a lot of ambient noise and ambient beauty. There was, like, great lighting effects. Like, you know, there was lore quotes underneath each map of where they were. And I was one of those weirdos who actually liked to read that. I'm like, oh, what planet is on this? What, what, like they, they took the time to write a little paragraph or two on each of those and place lore specific items all over the maps. And in a way that I know a lot of shooters do, but Halo Bungie in particular just went a little above and beyond that. If you were a lore nut like me, if you had read maybe the Fall of Reach and you went over to a computer screen and a multiplayer map, there might be a little connection there. And that makes it special. Like I said, the communication between developer and gamer uh, is just wonderful. And Halo Reach was a great swan song for uh, the Halo, the Bungie days. Uh, this game was, like I said, the last game that Bungie developed before they would move on to the Destiny series. And it was somber. Um, you know, it was scary, too. Uh, we didn't know it at the time how lucky we were, but Bungie was, and it still is, a wonderful company full of very creative people. And uh, how dare I forget, while speaking of Bungie, of talking about Marty O'Donnell and the soundtrack. Halo, throughout this time, throughout the Bungie games, um, my favorite first-person shooter soundtrack, and probably my top five soundtracks of all time, like my favorite soundtracks in no particular order off the top of my head, it's like, you know, Final Fantasy, Sonic series, um, Castlevania and Halo, uh, like, you, you really, you, those are the, like, Halo is that good, and Donkey Kong Country, I'm sorry, I said five, but Halo does rank, in my opinion, amongst the best composed video game scores of all time, and that was, that was permeated throughout this era, these five games, one, two, three, ODST and Reach, so like I said, if you're looking for just a heartfelt series of campaigns to go through that are a lot of fun and bombastic without being stupid, <laughs> pardon my language, but that's the best word I can say for some first-person shooter uh, campaigns that I play today, um, Halo may be the series for you. This era was fantastic. Um, and we're going to come back to this era and talk about it in a little bit, but... In 2012, it was time for a new developer to step up. That would be 343 Industries, uh, specifically des designed by Microsoft to make the Halo games. And uh, their first game would be this game right here, now Halo 4, a contentious title. And I can see why. Um, like I said, it was time for Chief to wake up. After five years of inactivity, we're finally back uh, on the boots, in the boots of the Master Chief. And um, it felt different. I don't know else how to put it. The game had a different... Uh, look then Halo Reach and Halo 3 now don't get me wrong it was wonderful this was a very late Xbox 360 game launching in 2012 a mere year before the Xbox one so it was pushing the graphics in a lot of ways I think it looks pretty damn good especially in the facial animations of characters but it had it, th these different visuals gave the series a very different vibe a very laminated look and uh, just in general the story of this is contentious you started to kind of it became more of a personal story. Like I said, Halo was more of a space opera, almost Gundam-esque in terms of, it's not really about the character, it's about the war, and the character is kind of the focal point uh, that you were viewing it through, and of course they are the most critical part, but it's not really about their personal growth. Halo 4 kind of changed that, where the story was very focused on the Master Chief and Cortana's personal relationship and their growth. I think they did it pretty tastefully. Um, it's not like you saw Chief actually break down in tears and wince in this. He was still as solemn as ever, but maybe you started to see a little bit more of the character behind the mask, but not so much to destroy the character that you had come to know for the last decade. And uh, I think this introduced a cool villain with the didact. I know that's a controversial statement. I just, 
I, I like his visual look. He looked like a 10 foot predator with some modifications, uh, very uh, foreboding voice, very ominous voice. However, it sucks that you barely fight him. That's a spoiler. You don't fight the main villain. It's more of a cutscene, quick time battle. I hated that. So there were some very odd um, kind of concessions and you know, you started to get more quippy with some of these side characters. Uh, they started to bring in more of the lore from the outer books that if you weren't keen on, you might miss out on. This is where the cracks uh, that would kind of become a chasm later would start to open with Halo 4, but I think it was a solid effort. The multiplayer, I can't really say the same. Uh, they had eliminated the what many other YouTubers and Halo fans have called uh, even starts out. You always in Halo and multiplayer start with the same weapon and you must go get the weapons and control of certain weapons in certain locations is the name of the game. That's how you play. You control power weapons and power position. You get the shotgun up a, up a ramp and that like the first one to get there is kind of going to control that area. But there was like loadouts and it was much more Call of Duty-esque. And if you're a Call of Duty fan, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what Halo fans came to Halo for. So I did not stick with um, the Halo 4 multiplayer flung. I don't think many people did. Not a bad game. A beautiful game. Um, some of the new weaponry wasn't fantastic, but some of the old returners were cool. Some good music still, some cool characters, but this is where, this was clearly not as embraced as it was as Halo 3 or even Reach to that extent. Decent campaign, not great multiplayer, but I wasn't super worried because obviously what this was was the beginning of a new trilogy. At least that's what it felt like. But uh, let's move on from Halo 4. Before I move any further, 343, before that, almost concurrently, only a few months before uh, Halo 4, released this game here as kind of a test. This is Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. What is this? This, for the 10th anniversary of Halo in 2011, uh, was 343 kind of remaking Halo 1 for the Xbox 360. And this has one of the coolest features that I think every remake should have. Some remakes, like the Wonder Boy remakes have this, where at a touch of a button, in real time, you could switch between original Xbox graphics to 360 graphics. Great feature. Uh, didn't really have its own multiplayer mode. Kind of fed off the Halo Reaches multiplayer mode. But if you wanted to replay the campaign with some new bells and whistles or collectibles like Skulls, which are game modifiers uh, and secret items, or, or and get some achievements, this wasn't bad. There was no reason at this time to think that 343 Industries was going to mess up Halo. Some people didn't like the look of the new visuals. Well, you could just switch them back. So, yeah, good start. So, kind of, they came out, I think, just under a year apart. Kind of their test unit, um, Halo... Halo Anniversary, and then their first real uh, foray into gaming, Halo 4. Uh, I wanted to mention Halo 4 first to get an idea of who 343 was. Yeah, some of that Bungie magic was kind of getting lost here, where you cannot feel the developer speaking to the gamer anymore. You can kind of feel the corporateness of it, which sucks, but it was, like I said, Halo 4, not too much to concern. They were trying for hard. There were some cool characters like Lasky, for those who know uh, Halo lore, wasn't too bad, but the introduction of the Spartan 4's other kind of snippy, snarky characters starting to grate a little bit, but not too much to worry about. We didn't have to start worrying until three full years later with the Halo's uh, series entrance on the Xbox One, a new game, uh, their first new game, with Halo 5 Guardians, the infamous one. How can... What to say about this that hasn't been said. If you're a Halo fan, you know what I'm about to say because it's not going to be too different. But if you're new to the franchise, well, Halo 5 is the most controversial game in the Halo series. It is usually considered the weakest, and I will be very quick and blunt to the point. I believe it is the weakest. Um, this is not a bad game, though. This is a beautiful game that is well-crafted. However, it does not feel like a Halo game. This game felt... This game came out in the uh, early years, two years into the Xbox One life cycle, where Xbox was really kind of, you know, when the Xbox One launched, I decided not to get one for many years uh, because I wasn't buying what they were selling. Obviously, it was, a, um, in the US, it was $100 more than the PS4, which was a more powerful system, but you were being charged for the Kinect. Um, there was the DRM, the digital rights management, and there just wasn't a ton of exclusives that I wanted, but I thought Halo 5 would be the one I'd buy the system for. But even before it came out, you can tell by the marketing, it was just a different vibe. Like, the, you could tell that this wasn't a Bungie joint, it wasn't even influenced by Bungie anymore. This was a 343 joint, maybe a Microsoft influence joint. Like, this felt so Doritos and Mountain Dew, you know what I'm saying? Um, it, it felt way more uh, yeah, like, yo, bro, let's go get them bad guys. Like, you know, the opening scene is four Spartans who are not Master Chief jumping out of a plane and looking invincible while they like parachute and then ski down sand while killing like a million enemy covenants, making them look like mooks, like jokes, like they're superheroes, making quick one-liners. I'm like, what is this? Where's that class that 
Halo had. Like, right off the campaign, like, this vibe is just wrong. And of course, Master Chief, not the focus of this game. Most of the game you play is Agent Walk, uh, the Spartan Ford on the right of this box here, but and, and, which is a very hated character. Um, you know, maybe not in and of himself the worst, but just because he took the spotlight, spotlight away from Master Chief. The marketing just lied to you by saying that the Master Chief would fight this character one-on-one, -on -one, that there would be like two conflicting stories that you would play each side of. No, you have a cutscene fight that is not really up to the level that you'd expect from two Spartans fighting. And um, the story goes in some very bizarre places. And there are some cool things about it. Um, but they added kind of a twitchiness to it. They added some more um, contemporary shooter features like quick moves and air dashes. And it, it just got away from kind of that controlled feeling that Halo had, that, that classy level. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sorry if you like this game. It, it's not a bad made game. And if this was your first Halo game and you liked it, I fully understand. And even if it's not, you just played the hell out of the multiplayer. I couldn't really get into the multiplayer. I've heard that is far better than Halo 4's because it kind of re-adds some of that uh, even starts again, but it just, it didn't have soul. And that's the best way I could put it. It didn't have the heart. Um, it didn't have that genuine article feeling that, you know, we, we were starting to lose with Halo 4, but it was just gone here. I'm like, what? it lost its identity, I guess is what it's saying. And it didn't feel like Halo 5. It took me a couple years to actually finish the campaign on this. I played a little bit out of Friends and we could tell right away uh, it wasn't what we wanted. And maybe that's spoiled sounding, but hey man, I'd stuck with this series for you know, quite a few games. I knew what I wanted out of a Halo. I knew even when they introduced the new thing. Um, and this just felt wrong. I didn't have a co-op campaign. Like I said, I went to my buddy's house. I had to watch him play. And I'm like, right off the bat, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, that's that's so dumb. Co-op campaign is what I live for. Uh, and for a couple years, it was just like that. 2015, this was the year that you didn't need to care about Halo. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence uh, that the Xbox brand just wasn't strong during the 8th generation. You had Xbox One far lagging behind the uh, PlayStation 4, and then later on being surpassed by the Switch very quickly. And um, that, that's due to a multitude of factors, including price, performance, uh, marketing, lack of exclusive. But I can't help but think that if there was a solid Halo that you know, maybe things would have been a little different. Maybe it wouldn't have beaten the PS4, but the Xbox One would be a slightly more memorable console than it is now. Nothing against the Xbox um, One. The Xbox One. I myself got an Xbox One X a few years uh, ago, a few years later after this game, and ended up quite liking a lot of things about it. But throughout its life, I have to say, I, even as a game collector, I didn't care to buy the console because there was not many reasons to. Which uh, brings us to today, uh, the year of our Lord, 2021. And um, how can I start this? Well, like I said, I recently got an Xbox One X about two years ago, and I decided to go through some of the exclusives, uh, some of the games that I wanted to play on, including Dead Rising 3, because I'm a shill for Capcom, uh, Katana Zero, because I didn't want to play it on my Switch, I wanted achievements. Um, but the one game that I had heard launched in 2014 was just a hot mess that I really stuck with, it was the game that you may have noticed I, over, uh, I looked over earlier, the Halo Master Chief Collection. Wow. Um, for those who are like me, do you remember when this launched in 2014 and it was going to be the selling point for the Xbox One before Halo 5 came out? And it was just a hot mess. You just constantly heard it doesn't work. It doesn't look right. Things are missing. It's glitchy. The online will crash. That's all I remember hearing about this game for years and years. There was a lot of updates, but then the major gaming outlets uh, and the gaming outlets that I checked just kind of went silent on it. But uh, in 2019, when I finally popped this in, when I finally had some time to sit down and give this a shot, I was absolutely blown away. This is, without doubt, in the top five game compilations I have ever played. And I've played a lot of them, my friends. Um, what this is today is not what it launched with. I did not know that for up until this day in 2021, seven years later, this game had has been... Uh, receiving updates. And I'm not talking tiny little uh, fake patches. I'm talking about semi-substantial content drops, patches, fixes, rebalances, new content that was never in the originals, um, PC options, obviously a PC port that's going over fairly well from what I'm to understand, uh, graphical fixes, texture packs, like the amount of work that has gone into this game for the length of, the, for the length of time that it has, Official support, I can't think of many other titles that have had seven years of massive support. The season system, so if you're unfamiliar, before I go any further with what this is, originally what this was, was Halo 1 through 4 with all the campaign and multiplayer maps 
online available to you with a brand new multiplayer Halo, uh, brand new multiplayer mode based on Halo 2, but with modern Halo 5 ish uh, graphics. So that's four campaigns and five multiplayer modes um, on this disc. And it didn't work at first. Basically, there, there's a many things you can go check out over why, but eventually, when I played this, what this was was uh, more than that. They uh, added Halo Reach and ODST for a mere five dollars each uh, to get the campaigns and multiplayer in there. So you ended up with uh, let's see, that's Halo 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, ODST Reach, six campaigns and seven multiplayers full in this game. Uh, I couldn't believe it. And they worked. They worked fantastically. I replayed throughout late 2019 when, you know, all of us had a lot more time uh, because of certain reasons of being at home, all the Halo campaigns. And it reignited my passion for the series. After Halo 4 I, in 2012, I had lost all interest in Halo, almost all interest in Halo for many years. I loved it, but I thought it was a series that was left behind and just was never going to be brought back like Silent Hill. But looking at the devotion that 343 has stuck with for the Master Chief Collection, making Halo 1, to this day in 2021, making the Halo 1 campaign look more like the original Xbox version as opposed to the buggy Windows Vista version that was released that originally was based off of, like little tiny things like that. Uh, fog options, the, the option to adjust your where your gun is on your screen. Like these are very new features in a somewhat old game, 2014. Like the the Switch wasn't out and the, the PS4 uh, and the Xbox One were only a year and a half into their life cycle, a year as it were. Um, this game is still getting new maps for Halo 3. A game originally released in 2007 is getting new maps in 2021. I believe there are three brand new maps brought over from Halo Online, which was some weird Russian online Halo game refitted into Halo 3, but it's still being supported. New content, new skins uh, that you can unlock during their season system, where basically if you play the game, you get points to unlock cosmetic content. Some of it is very cool. Some of it was um, cut content in prior games that was only seeing marketing materials. Like these are deep, deep cuts. And the great thing is, if you want to keep the Halo experience entirely traditional, you can turn off those cosmetics. So even though the other player equips them, you don't see them because they don't affect gameplay. So it doesn't break the illusion that you're playing an older game. And it's truly wonderful, the amount of sheer content, playlists on this, multiplayer modes, multiplayer maps. The, the campaigns are wonderful. I suggest that if you haven't tried this, you've heard it's bad. This is cheap now. Go pick this up. Buy the Halo 3 and ODST and go through this series. I did it and I, I couldn't get enough. There's in-game challenges. Uh, the, the achievements are fun. Uh, there's like 700 of them. I, I needed to get half. I remember, I'm like, all right, I can't get them all because that'll take three years. But I wanted to get at least 351. It took me like three months. I would just, put, for three months, basically, I, I just went through this and had friends come over who also, at my age, had kind of left Halo in the past. Like, hey, let's play some split screen Halo. Um, which one do you want to do today? One, two, three, ODST, uh, two anniversary. And they were all great. Like we just kept bouncing in between them. Like what what happened to this series? And given other than four, these are all bungee games. So maybe it was 343, you know, their fault for making that magic kind of go away. But 343 is also the studio that is working on this and has made it the collection it is today. Like I said, if you're a doubter, try it. He said it's cheap, it's on PC, it's on Xbox, give it a shot. Um, I think Microsoft has learned their lesson. They have been doing multiple deals with like Switch and, uh, you know, releasing Banjo Kazooie and Minecraft Steve to Smash Brothers, as well as, you know, getting Cuphead out there and Ori in the Blind Forest, uh, allowing this game to finally be reported to PC in 2020 last year. And um, I, I think they're trying to appease fans, but, and, and that might feel like groveling, but I, I'm not feeling that way anymore. I think Microsoft 343, I think that whole side is something I'm gonna be paying attention to throughout this generation. Um, of course, I started by getting a PlayStation 5 because PlayStation 5, you're not gonna beat it. You're not gonna, like they just have too many titles, but I think the Series X could be a contender. Not right now, but I, I like that competition. Like, while, you know, console snobs, like, you know, oh, Xbox is better than Play, PlayStation, better than Xbox or Switch, whatever, PC, that's all nonsense. You go where the good games are, at least if you can. I know that's very not affordable for everybody, but myself, I go where the good games are. I don't care what I play it on. But what I do believe is that the competition is good. Um, anyone who says that Xbox and PlayStation, even their executives say they're not in a race, they're lying. Um, because you go to a store and they're on two shelf, they're on the same shelf. You have an Xbox game and a PlayStation game they're right next to each other. You need to choose which one you're going to buy and who you're going to give your um, money to. So of course they're competing. And I think that's good because competition breeds innovation. 
Um, as long as it's not, it doesn't get nasty I, amongst the fans. I like when a company's like, they made a good game. We got to make a good game. And that's, that's good. That pushes any medium forward. That pushes every media, like any rivals. Like this is, you know, Naruto and Sasuke. You got to push each other to make each other better. And uh, PlayStation kind of blew away Xbox over the last decade. But if the Series X can follow, and we're going to get to the topic we're going to finish, uh, finish this conversation with, can make Halo Infinite a success. And with all the massive companies that uh, purchases that Xbox has made, Bethesda and um, Double Fine and uh, Ninja Theory, I think Xbox uh, is something to keep your eye on, which brings, like I said, me to Infinite. Now, here we are. Infinite is basic, is Halo 6. It took me a, a few months to realize that after the launch. I thought it was going to be, it was a little unclear what was it going to be. Is it going to be Halo Battle Royale? Is it going to be Halo Open World? Blah, blah, blah. No, it, it's Halo 6 in terms of at least the story. And uh, this is out of Wild Ride. I was at the E3 in 2018 when this was announced. Not much to see, just some open world uh, kind of vistas. And it, it looked like Halo 1, which was wonderful, but I didn't, you know, there was not much to go on. Then a year later, a uh, year and a half, almost two years, uh, last year, a year and a half ago, there was the um, infamous Craig the, the Brute trailer for Halo Infinite. We really got to see what this game was going to look like, at least in a campaign sense. And to be honest with you, maybe I'm blinded because I play so many old games and new games. I go back and forth from like the newest PCs to like, you know, NES. I, I'm not a stickler for graphics. I go for like, oh, that's the look they were going for, right? As long as the game runs relatively smoothly, I'm fine. Like, um, I did not think that Halo Infinite, and string me up if you must, trailer was hideous. I didn't think it was the best looking game I'd ever seen. But I'm like, oh look, cool! Like I, I was looking more like, oh, they're mixing brutes and elites. That's something you don't, you didn't, you haven't seen since Reach. And you know, uh, I was looking like, oh, look at how this weapon fires. I wasn't actually looking at the graphical fidelity so much. I think that's only people who kind of slowed it down and really looked at it. And sure, it wasn't pretty when you did that. Um, I don't think it deserved the massive backlash that it received. But I'm glad that it did in a way that it pushed the game back a solid year to almost now till. December 2021, uh, so they could work on that game because it would not have been. I, I I don't think that would have been a good game that launched a year ago. So that's that's where we're going to talk about now. Um, Halo Infinite has so much riding on its shoulders. I think that Bungie, uh, you know, left huge shoes to fill, and 343 just hasn't done it in a lot of ways with their last two main titles. However. They've gotten back into the good graces of, I think, a lot of the people with the Master Chief Collection. I, I know there's a contingent of continued support for that game, and I think fans recognize, like, hey, they're, they're making the right moves. And when they came back and showed more footage and released the open betas for Halo Infinite recently, I heard a lot of positivity. I've heard some apprehension. Of course, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. But it felt a little bit more right. I myself have not played those betas. I, I did not have the chance to, and I also don't want to. I want to play that finished product so that uh, my opinion isn't painted too much by a beta that I may like, uh, or maybe that they let take something away that I do like. But I do watch some coverage of it because I need to know what's going on. I want to hear from people, uh, outlets that I trust, like Easy Allies or, or, or you know, um, Good Vibes Gaming. Like, how does this feel? You know, because I trust those opinions. And mostly, I'm hearing positive things, and that's fantastic. The fact that, hey, this feels like Halo. That's all I really need to hear. I've seen some gameplay, and it's hard, you know, when it's not in your hands to say, hey, this feels like Halo. You can get an idea of the visuals and the artistic style. And yeah, it does seem like more traditional Halo. But, you know, we live in an era that is so strange for first-person shooters, or shooters in general. Call of Duty is no longer quite the king it used to be. Warzone is massive, but it is a massive... Of, uh, massive as something as Fortnite, I strongly don't think so. I know so that it's not. Um, and I think Halo 5's problem that it was influenced too much by the big boy at the time in the in the in the park, and that would be Call of Duty. It took too many influences from Call of Duty, which is a wonderful series in and of itself, but uh, for the fans. But that wasn't what Halo's game was. It, it wasn't you know its bag. Uh, and Halo Infinite could have gone in the sun route, same route. Could it have been uh, just a battle royale service uh, like like corporate? kind of juggernaut, I'm not getting that vibe. I've seen many people that say, I want a Halo Battle Royale, and uh, wonderful YouTubers like Ant Dude and whatnot, um, who are against it, I should say, but like, you know, giant streamers like Dr. Disrespect saying, oh, there should be a Battle Royale. But I agree with Ant Dude on this one. Like, that can come later, but I'm glad it's not the focus because, you know, four and five were different types of Halo games. I think it's time to kind of go back to the roots. You had a decade of doing other things, some good, some not. 
I think what we just need now is a polished shooter that feels like Halo, and most importantly, has that heart, that je ne sais quoi uh, kind of whimsy, that cosmic story and the campaign, just a good campaign, man. That's That was really where Halo 5 fell apart. And it, it's so weird how they're releasing this game. You gotta pay for the campaign, but the multiplayer is free. If you're paying for that campaign, it better be pretty damn good. Now, I don't expect it to be as good as Halo 1, uh, Halo 1's campaign, but I want it to be close. We've had six years of no Halo, and uh, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with writing themselves out of the corner that Halo 5 put them into, uh, up to. And I've seen they brought on some writers and some creative heads from the old Halo games. I hope they've helped because that's the first thing that I'm going to play. It's not going to be the first thing a lot of people play, but I will judge that game very strongly on its campaign. And of course on the multiplayer as well. But if a game only has gets a you know a low score in the campaign department and a high score in the multiplayer player department, in my book, it's an average game. And this game can't be average. I think this is the last chance that Halo has to recapture some of the magic that it used to have. To be what it used to be, the, the clout. The Halo used to be the big boy in town, and uh, it, then it was just one of the boy, big boys in town, and now it's... It's on this in this weird nebulous area where it can be forgotten if this game is bad or it can rise to new heights. Do I think it's going to be bigger than Fortnite when it comes out? No. But could it reach the levels of something like Apex Legends or, dare I say, even something like Warzone? It's not entirely out of the realm of possibility since it's a crossplay between PC and Xbox. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to see that. I would love to, Halo to be one of the big boys again. I think this is its last shot. I think fans, there's been enough time for the wounds to heal from 5 that where we want it to be good we don't we aren't going uh screw you 343 we will hope you your game is like burn we want bungie to come back or we don't want any halo that isn't bungie because let me tell you bungie were the masters but they're not coming back to this franchise anytime soon i think people are like okay let's give these guys one more shot they've been working real hard on making this they delayed the game a full year this game was supposed to be a launch game for the series x basically and that didn't happen because the fans weren't happy and they want to please us now, don't get me wrong that could be seen as pandering and definitely don't get me wrong on the fact that it's not looking perfect the fact that there is no forge or particularly co-op campaign at launch which they said there would be is insane and that, what would this game have been a year ago when it launched if now it's still not launching with those fundamental features that's really making me nervous i think that made a lot of people nervous because co-op campaign is fantastic and forge is something that halo has that the other first person shooters and third person shooters just don't um and, and they say it'll come three to six months later, but, you know, in this world where, you know, three to six months can easily become one to two years later, like, are you going to replay that campaign in co-op? Like, no, pro like, I don't know. Is it going to be so good? You're like, oh, it's so good going through a single player. Let's go through it again six months later. That's a tough pill to swallow, man. So yet again, while there's a lot of hope, while these betas have shown to be very promising, the visuals have been strongly upgraded, there is still some fear that maybe that needed even more time. Um, so I'm in a weird spot right now. Now I would love to know what you guys think that that's where we are now. One month away. I really, I'm praying. I feel like for once the Halo fan base, which is pretty divided, like what's the best one, two, three, ODST reach the Bungie games are good. Three, four, three games are good. I feel for once we're all united. When we look at this game that we've been waiting for, for six years, the end of the, the kind of new trilogy as it was built, uh, almost, you know, nine years ago now. We want it to be good. We don't want it to be good. We want it to be great. It needs to be great. This is Halo's last chance to cement itself uh, in the, like for a new decade. Um, I, I don't think if this game flops that Halo 7 might even happen. And if it does, no one will care as much. Um, people care now. There is hype for this. And the, series, and the fact that it's on the Xbox One X and PC as well is fantastic because the Series X is really hard to get. I can't even get one right now. Um, so yeah, th this just... Please, listen to me, guys. This is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about hype. This is a beautiful time. Where right now, it, it's, it's, you know, it's Schrodinger's cat. It could be fantastic or bad. It's both at the same time. I want to believe that it's fantastic. I'm having fun hoping, believing that's going to be good. I'm, ex you know, I'm ready for if it's not. But I'm, I'm expecting not a good game. I'm expecting a great game. That's what I want. I think that's what this franchise needs. Um, I think it's really, you know, maybe in a way it's going to be really smart to make you know, multiplayer free to play, but we'll see how that all turns out. But thank you for listening to me rant about this. But what I really want to ask is, 
What is your Halo experience? Were you a fan 20 years ago? Can you believe it's been 20 years? Next week, November 2015, so 10 days away from this recording, uh, will be the 20th anniversary of Halo. This game, Master Chief has been as ra- around as long as Dante and Samanosuke Akechi from uh, Onimusha. Like, that's nuts to me. It just seems like, you know, something of a graph, you know, a, a technological jump. Like, what was your Halo experience back then, if you had one? When did you jump on? What game was the one that brought you to the series? Have you never played it? Were you always on the outside and saying, hey, this series stinks. Uh, I don't want anything to do with it. Um, but maybe now you're like, what, what was, what's this Halo thing about? What I walk, what hope you, I hope you walk away from is, I hope that somewhere in along with what I've said, it's piqued your interest just a little bit to ask, make you ask that question: Why is this series that is so strongly tied to Xbox so special? Um, I, I think that gamers are more mature than outsiders give us credit for. I don't think we, you know, really care about what console. Uh, you get any more if you're a PlayStation guy, Xbox guy. We're just gamers now, right? We got to fight the normies. We got to keep those outside. We're we're a group together, and Halo. Um, is a game that I think everyone has to at least somewhat know about. So yet, a, please tell me, what is your experience? Are you interested in Halo? Where do you want to start? Are you getting Infinite? What are your thoughts on Infinite? What are your thoughts on the lack of co-op in Forge? What did you think about that graphical presentation a year ago with Craig the Brew? I want to know, and I'll try to respond to your comments as quickly as possible. Um, and I, I love that you, my viewers, my subscribers, have been leaving comments and I've had some really good uh, conversations with people through them. I'll try to get to them as quickly as I can. And especially on a series that I love so, so much uh, as this. And you know what, what else to say? Um, Halo Infinite, you know, what's the one word to sum up with? What what, what do I want to go out, out with? Believe. Thank you. My name is Mike and this has been Chip Damage. Have a great night.